Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the May 2020 Teaching and Learning Committee meeting for um, the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners. I do want to just uh, preface today's meeting by first um, wishing all of our teachers and educators out there happy National Teacher Day, as we are certainly in um, National Teacher Appreciation Week. And I'm gonna put our commissioners on the spot um, right now while while uh, we're waiting for others to join us. But Dr. Bondima, can you share with us why why did you start teaching? Why did you get into education? Oh, that's a wonderful story. I um I slipped into teaching. My goal was not to be a teacher. My goal was to be an MD. And during um my year college, I, I was in I'm, so, I'm sorry, someone needs to mute themselves. Well, I was teaching a chemistry lab and on my first right out of first undergrad, and I enjoyed it so much, and it was straight into higher education. I never taught from K through 12, and um, from there on in, I went from lab instructor to teaching lecture as a professor. And I loved every minute of it, teaching uh, inorganic and organic chemistry. And um, then I started developing science programs for K through 12 kids in programs called uh, Gear Up and also programs called uh, Under Kellogg. And um, from there on in, I just went from um, teaching undergraduate students all the way through doctorate students. And... Um, and then sometimes working with uh, teachers in Baltimore City Public Schools and other teachers around. And I've really developed a, a relationship with teachers and principals. And I just, I, and I just loved it. I love the research. I love working with teachers. And when I wrote grants, I'm going to say this real quick. When I wrote grants and went into the classroom and in schools with my grants, the, the principal would tell, used to tell me, you wrote this grant, but I'm going to tell you how we do it in school. And I developed a wonderful relationship with the teachers. They taught me and I taught them. So that, that was my experience working with um, K through 12 and higher education. So thanks That's, for asking me. Absolutely. That's awesome, Dr. Bondima. Commissioner Roberts, now you're not a, um, a teacher per se, but um, what teacher had an impact on you and why? If you can think of one, because it's hard for me to sometimes think of just one teacher, but if you can think of one teacher that made an impact on you and why, just just tell us that. Ah, uh, great question. Um, I think, <laughs> I will say the biggest impact uh, was my fifth grade teacher at Yorkwood Elementary, Miss Burton. And I like have been searching for a teacher, maybe from like, the fifth grade promotion ceremony, but I can't find it. Um, but I remember Miss Burton being not only an instructor and stern, but caring at the same time. Um, she she set a lot of like foundational principles um, at that very young age that I still remember a lot of the things she said. One of my good girlfriends and I, we still joke because I was a safety. And I remember being outside one day without my coat and she took my belt because I wasn't following the rules. And I always joke about that because she took my safety belt and I <laughs> fell away. <laughs> I, I, from then on out, then when I needed to go outside to patrol with my safety belt, I needed my coat. Oh. And so, um, so for all of the Miss Burtons of the district, you are appreciated. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we celebrate all of you. Um, I'm not going to take that much more time up with that, but I just thought that would be a wonderful way to kind of start this meeting, um, teaching and learning, National Teacher Appreciation Week. I thought that would, would be cool. Um, and I'll share if we have some more time later in the agenda. I do want to move on into um, a compliance report review of our public charter school policy, IHBJ. And I believe we have, I know that there are tons of teachers on this um, calling in the meeting right now. 
but I believe that this will be Chief Jones and um, Ms. Alvarez, Angela Alvarez, with us. So it's, it's all yours. Hey, um, can you guys hear me? Sorry, yep. I'm having some tech issues. Hi, this is um, Angela Alvarez. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. And this is Teresa Jones, Chief Achievement and Accountability Officer. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. And hi, this is Trevor Roberts. I'm a specialist in the Office of New Initiatives. Is someone speaking? We can't hear anything. Thanks, Christian. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now we can hear you. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, the purpose of this report is to do a review. On the last year, we had complete data. So this is a backwards looking report. It looks back to school year 1819. Um, and by policy, we need to give you a review on what's happened with fis fiscal accountability, student performance, and other matters uh, pursuant to charter. So it's a way for us to, to sort of get a, an update to the board. One thing to note about this year's report is not only do we have this PowerPoint presentation, but we have a written report um, that is uh, a component. Uh, and this will be, you know, on the district website and shared with families as well. Next slide. Thanks, Angela. Um, so charters uh, play an important role in city schools portfolio. Um, 34 out of the 52 charters in the state of Maryland are in Baltimore City. And those 34 schools in uh, 1819 serve 19% of our student population. Um, Excuse me, uh, do you have a PowerPoint up? Yes, you should be able to see yeah, it. Yes, Dr. Bondima, it's the same as what is in board docs. Okay, good, I'm good, thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to note about that 19% number is that in last year's compliance report, um, it mistakenly reported only 14% of the student population uh, was in charter schools. That was actually the number for uh, what we call wholly new charters and not uh, charters overall. So last year in 2017-18, in um, we see similar numbers as we see for this year. So 15,414 um, students were in 2017-18 um, and that was again, 19% of the student population. Um, if you could go to the next slide, I will explain the difference between wholly new and conversion charters. Um, so charters are in one of two categories, either wholly new charters, which are new schools that are created through an application process. And those schools serve students um, citywide through a lottery process. Uh, we have 26 of those schools. There are also conversion charters, which were existing neighborhood schools which converted to charter and still serve their neighborhood zone. And that is eight schools. Um, as you can see, most of our charter students are in wholly new charter schools. Um, again, that's 26 schools and um, there are eight conversion charter schools. Trevor, if I, if I may, um, just for one second, I just want to um, ask the commissioners that if they have questions while presentation is going on. We have a wonderful chat feature that we can use. Um, and there are multiple staff members that are um, on this call with us. So perhaps they can answer those questions in real time while the presentation is. Uh, forgive me. Excuse me, Trevor. No, thanks. That's a good point. For this next slide, we're going to take a look at where these schools are located across the city. This map is depicting uh, how schools are placed relative to the Community Conditions Index. You may recall that the Community Conditions Index is one of the ways that we look at neighborhood characteristics and understand which communities may be more or less resourced than others. So there is a key that is noted in the middle of the screen. 
So the red areas are those that have the lowest level of investment, whereas the green ones are the high investment areas. What you'll notice here is that when we look at our charter schools, that they are located throughout the Baltimore community. Um, and you'll note again that even in a significant percentage of those uh, red areas that you see, um, and then those that are more highly resourced are in the green areas. Next slide, please. So for this next slide, um, we wanted to point out kind of notable efforts. So um, this is focused on school year 1819. So it does include things that fall outside of that. Um, we got assistance from our, for this whole report actually with, from our charter and operator led schools advisory board. Um, so they, we always review the report from last year to think about if there's new data points to share with the board, as well as to help us make sure we're identifying notable efforts. Um, so we focused on um, just important um, things that were happening with schools that happened um, uh, in the 1819 school year um, and that were reflective of school practice. So we don't include things like um, sports or things like that. Um, so we wanted to note um, uh, partnerships. That's one of the things that we've been, been increasingly trying to do more of. And so um, Baltimore Curriculum Project um, who, you know, operates uh, five of our conversion schools and is a recognized leader in restorative practices, um, has actually partnered with like Pimlico um, this school year to help around climate. And so we're increasing partnerships with schools. So we want to acknowledge that because that's important about how we share practices across school types. Um, healthy schools, so AFIA, Public Charter School and Empowerment um, were recognized um, with a Healthier Generation grant by the Alliance for their work um, in student staff welfare and health, healthy eating and physical activities. Next slide. Um, and then strong leadership, as you know, as a district, we have a Heart of the Schools Award that recognizes 10 exceptional principles. Um, and five of them received the Heart of the Schools Award itself. Um, so for um, school year 2019, um, Charles Kramer um, of Patterson Park received the Heart of the Schools Award and the honorees in that year were Mark Gaither for Wolf Street Academy um, and Dia Hafiz Slayton for the Bel Air Edison School. Uh, additionally, um, Furman Templeton um, Preparatory Academy has been recognized for their um, excellence in gifted and talented education and specifically their work with economically disadvantaged students. And they've sort of doubled down on that work by um, joining um, a mentoring program that um, allows students to have access to mentors from the Maryland School of Medicine. Um, again, deepening how they're working with students um, who are gifted. Next slide. When we look at um, the demand for charter schools, there are several schools that uh, year after year kind of bubble up to the top. Um, these schools, schools all have um, really strong branding. They have um, recruitment efforts that are, are very strong, including um, dedicating staff specifically to recruiting. And they also have a very active online presence, both on the website and on social media. Um, so we just wanted to shout out these schools, um, Baltimore Montessori, Green Street, Kip, and Tunbridge have all been in the, at the top wait list numbers for uh, the last three years. So they're doing really good things with um, bringing students to their schools. I, I have a question. Before you, is it okay um, uh, uh, if we ask some questions before you move on? You did say it was okay, is that correct? Sure. Are you, that's fine, Dr. Bondima. Okay, I just wanna, this, is, this area is, is absolutely critical. When you say that most schools, these particular schools have a tendency to, to attract students all the time. And I'm wondering, when we talk about partnerships, it's doing your professional development that you usually have at the beginning of the year, beginning of the semester, is it possible or do you share or have these schools give a workshop to all the other schools to give them some clues, some hints, some advice on uh, ways to recruit? and some of the things that they're doing at their school to recruit, because if they're doing such a wonderful job, which they are, it should, it, I mean, they share this information in workshops and 
just like the consultant would. Yeah, I mean, so we do do um, sessions with schools before the lottery season and have schools share best practices. Um, and we can think about different ways to do that. Um, these are schools that have, you know, strong, like uh, Trevor said, have strong wait lists and there's practices that they have in place um, that are good. So we can look at uh, additional ways, but we definitely have them share best practices when we do um, prep for the lottery season every year. Um, some of it too, like comes to name recognition is an important part of it. Um, so you're looking at schools too, who've been around for a while. Um, and so I think that plays in, but they, they definitely have strong practices that are worth um, making sure other schools are aware of. So I think that's a good uh, idea. Stand on one foot and become an airplane. So you're going to lean over. I can't hear some of the background sound is there. So what did you say, Angela? Oh, was it Teresa? It was, it was Angela. I just said it was a, it's a good idea. We I said we do a little bit of that when we prep for the lottery season where schools share some of their best practices. Um, but, you know, we can think through if there's a, another way to do that. And I would just say name recognition is also part of it, but there are real things that each of these schools are doing that are um, worthy of sharing with other people. Yeah, I think it's a good idea because not only can they do it doing professional mm -hmm. development and it's absolutely critical, especially for schools that have low enrollment and maybe one, they can, not everybody can do it, but they can do it as a, uh, as a team and share the information because then it will help them the following year. Yeah. I mean, we should definitely look at it. One thing I will say is like when we do this report next year, these numbers look really different. So that's something we need to understand. So there's a big difference between um, this year and prior years when we look at wait lists. And something different definitely happened this year prior to COVID. So it's not about COVID. Uh, lotteries were in February, and there were there was a shift there. So we need to understand that a little bit better. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So this next section, we're going to start taking a look at the characteristics of the students that are attending our various types of schools. The first slide takes a look at what this means as it relates to direct certification. Um, just as a reminder, the district moved to becoming a community eligibility provision district in 2015-16, which basically means that we no longer collect the free and reduced meal forms as a way to understand student need. Um, as a result, we now have a new measure of poverty, which is direct certification. So you'll see reference here to directly certified students. And so what this slide shows us is how does that particular characteristic play out across the different school types? So what you'll note here is that our conversion charters continue to be the school type that has the majority or the largest percentage, I should say, of directly certified students, whereas the wholly new charters um, continue to be the lowest, um, but you do see that there is a continuing trend downward um, just overall in terms of how poverty rates have continued to decline as we started using this direct certification as our poverty measure. Next slide, please. This next view um, basically takes a look at race ethnicity. Um, and as it relates to that characteristic, um, our enrollment of black and white students has remained flat. Um, over this time period where we have seen quite a bit of an increase overall in our Latino or Latinx population, uh, particularly in our traditional schools. But you'll notice that we do see that that population is staying flat when we take a look at charters overall. Next slide, please. So this is looking at um, our students with disabilities population in comparison to their um, general ed populations. Our conversion charters have a lower proportion of students with disabilities than our wholly new charters in our traditional schools, as you can see from the um, numbers on the slide. The bulk of our students with disabilities population by percentage is not surprising in our alternative or specialized schools. Next slide. It's important when we're talking about um, students with disabilities that we understand um, what their least restrictive environment is. Uh, and so um, students who have a L-E-R-E-A mean that they're spending the majority of their time um, in classes with their um, general ed pairs. Um, B, they're spending um, uh, 
some more time in um, um, separate classes and then the LREC are in self-contained um, classes and then the LREs, other LREs have other needs and could be in other environments. When we look at um, our populations because of how we're resourced, um, it, it, students with disabilities who are in LRE levels of C or higher um, require more resources to educate. So our conversion charters in our traditional schools have higher proportions of students um, with those levels than our wholly new schools. So you can see, for example, our conversion charter charters have like 26% of their population in the LREC um, category. 17% um, um, is the overall charters uh, and conversions are on par with our traditional schools. I think what's important to note is that our most expensive students to educate are in our other LREs, which are in our alternative programs. Um, and, you know, we fund schools based on um, the needs of students when it comes to um, students with disabilities to ensure that students are resourced based on their need, which I think is the right way to do it. Next slide. Now we're going to move on to uh, looking at um, teachers and principals at charter schools. Um, we can see some kind of larger trends around um, the race of, of uh, teachers and principals um, and the years of teaching experience. So if we want to go on to the next slide, we can take a look at that. So as we can see here, um, charter schools have a lower proportion of black teachers than traditional schools. Um, it should be noted though that for wholly new charters, um, the proportion of black teachers has risen from 31% in 1718 to 36%. So while they're still below traditional schools, um, we do see some movement uh, one year to the next at those wholly new charters. If you wanna go to the next slide, we can see that um, likewise with principals, uh, charter principals on the whole are um, fewer black uh, principals than at traditional schools. I have a question, this is Dr. Benzema. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. You know, for the past three years and for three it's years, a for three years, we have had a discussion about hiring teachers of color and principals of color, and it's and we we talk to different uh, leaders, the leadership in the charter schools, and we always emphasize that, but it doesn't seem to change. What is it that are they? Are we following them to determine if they are making the proper moves in order to recruit? But what are recruitment methods? Or what are their methods for recruiting people of color? It's a conversation about also um, some of the schools with um, recruiting African American uh, students of color. What are we doing to encourage them to get on board to increase that, that percentage? Anybody can answer. Can you hear me? Hello? Sorry, sorry, I was on mute. I apologize. I thought it was okay. so I'm still adjusting <laughs> to this distance. I feel like you're on two minutes. Yeah. We are. <laughs> um, so in renewal we we look at that and there has been a change. So like schools are attuned to that. Um, throughout the renewal application, we're asking questions that get at equity. Like we know, you know, research supports and we know that's important for um, students, particularly black students who have black teachers and they have black leaders uh, in terms of how it impacts their development and their um, uh, academics within schools um, because of the standards um, that um, black teachers have for students. And so schools are aware of that. And so um, there has been a change. I think um, Trevor, you know, pointed out 
um, a, a change in the percentage going up. And so schools are, are focusing on that, but it's something that we look at um, it's one of the things we look at in renewal uh, around our practices and that fidelity to charter um, section. And it's something we can continue to refine, um, Commissioner Bradima, as we do those review processes. But I will say, I think schools are trying to do a lot of things differently and to improve in this area. So we see schools changing their recruit recruitment practices, um, getting more connections with um, uh, our, our schools, um, our black schools, our black college, our historically black college, our HBCUs, in terms of trying to recruit um, teachers from those schools. Um, and so um, we are seeing changes as in practice. I think it takes time to show up in the data, right? Because you got to think about when you have existing schools, the number of teachers that they're hiring, there are only maybe a few openings, right? So it's going to take time to show up in the data. But we do see schools writing thoughtfully about that in their practice and providing evidence of that. Um, in their renewal applications. Okay, yeah, thank you. We can go to the next slide. Um, so next we're just talking about the length of service. So for traditional and conversion schools, we see more experienced um, principals than we do in wholly new um, charters. In particular, our conversion schools are only like a handful of schools. We talked about the top when we're looking at school year 18, 19, we're talking about eight schools. But within those schools, you know, you see a concentration of um, people um, with uh, five or more years of service and, and, and 10 years of service. Um, so that's an important thing to note. Um, next slide. Similarly, I think we skipped a slide. Sorry, can we go back? We didn't talk about teachers. We went from um, yeah, back one more slide. Um, uh, our traditional schools have more experienced teachers than conversions who have more experienced teachers in wholly new charters. Um, and so that's just something to note too, in terms of um, experience within the classroom. And that's also something that has been a little bit of a trend um, since we've been looking at this data point um, so that we're paying attention to. Okay, we can go forward. Um, now we're gonna talk about um, park performance. Um, you know, as we've shared, it's important for members of the public to understand that there is a correlation between the results on um, park scores and household income, and that holds reg regardless of school type. Uh, and so we tried to control for that. And so we're going to um, look at um, schools whose economic disadvantage rate is in the 60 to 70 percent range, because that's where the district average is. Um, what we have found since we've been looking at schools in this way is not really the school type that matters. It's the it's the work of individual schools um, that really um, has an impact on performance. Next slide. Teresa. Sorry about that. My apologies. Uh, so for this particular slide, I'm going to take a minute to just describe how to look at this data. Um, so first and foremost, this slide gives us the park assessment results for grades three through five. As Angela mentioned, here we're just going to take a look at the performance of schools whose economic disadvantage rate places them in the group of 60 to 70 percent. There is a footnote that gets into more of the nuanced definition of economically disadvantaged. I'll just point out here that this builds on the earlier definition of directly certified students. So it is a little bit more of a broader definition, but the majority of the students that are included in this economic disadvantage definition are those that were directly, directly certified. So in looking at this, what we call quadrant view, the way we've organized this is that on the vertical axis, you'll see where it says math three to five, that gives the scale score for that math assessment. So you'll see a little average line there that says 712. So the district average for this particular 
band of assessment scores is 712. So schools that are placed above that line have an average score that is above that district average. On the horizontal axis, that is the information for the English language arts assessment, again, for grade band three to five. So when we take a look at how these schools are placed, a dot is actually placed at the intersection of their math score and their ELA score. So for those schools that are in that top right quadrant, those are the schools that actually have above average performance in both the English language arts and math assessment for part grade three to five. You'll also note here that these are color coded based on the school type. So it gives you the ability to see where our wholly new charters and conversion charters perform relative to the traditional schools. So here again, this is the view for grades three to five. Next slide, please. And then on this slide, we take a look at the results for grades six to eight. So same orientation, but here you'll see in terms of the math six to eight score, you'll see average noted as 702. So again, schools that perform above that are above that line. And if you look at the ELA, that average is 709. So schools to the right have scores that are above that. So again, you can see depicted where the traditional schools fall relative to the wholly new and conversion charter schools. Next slide, please. Another way that we take a look at assessment performance is to take a look at growth. Um, and so I'm just gonna give a little bit of a, an overview around one of the many ways that we look at growth which is by using what we call the student growth percentile or the SGP. We think of this as a way to create a student to student peer comparison um, of performance. So it actually shows us the progress that students make compared to other students that scored similarly with the same scale score for the prior year. And we take a look here at how these students perform versus other students across the entire state of Maryland. As we take a look at how to make sense of this, um, we calculate a median, which allows us to take a school level view of how those student level SDPs come together in order to take a look at how well schools are actually uh, getting students um, to perform versus better um, than their, their peers. So when you take a look at this scale, you'll see from the very low to the very high, where you see a typical band that says 41 to 60. The way to interpret that is if there is an SDP of 60, it means that the students in a given school on average grew more than 60% of their peers. So in an ideal world, we certainly would wanna see our students in the, at a minimum in that typical category. And our schools, we really wanna to encourage to push towards getting students into the high, and it's very exceptional, but it is possible um, in limited cases to get to the very high SCP range of 81 to 100. Again, we're gonna take a look at this now as it relates to individual schools and how well they are moving students along that, that trajectory. Next slide, please. So um, in our elementary grades, um, so you'll see on the um, left-hand side, uh, our high performing schools in terms of growth for English language arts. And then on the right is for math. Um, so of, of particular note, you see Patterson Park Public Charter School, Hampstead Hill, and Empowerment um, having high um, growth for their students um, in English language arts. On the, in math, we see Wolf Street and Hampstead Hill, again, having high growth. And I say that also you know, correlates for how we get schools in renewal. These are schools that have consistently received um, five-year renewals because uh, you see that work um, in the evidence in renewal. And Wolf Street, you know, is our first school to get an eight-year renewal. Next slide. Uh, and so here we're looking at um, middle grade, so the same kind of look. Uh, and so our high performers in terms of charter schools um, for English language arts and middle grades, again, Hampstead Hill, Empowerment, Midtown, and Tunbridge. And then for math, you have Hampstead Hill, Tunbridge, and Green Street Academy, which is a school that serves students in grades six through 12. Okay, we're going to move on to looking at um, secondary students. So we should just note that um, there are six charters with high school programs. They serve uh, nearly 2000 students. And when we're looking at this high school data, these schools are split up into charter schools, uh, traditional schools that have selective entrance criteria, and traditional non-selective schools. Um, each of these school types 
have uh, very different student populations, as we can see. Yep, that's right. So I think that the thing we have to hold, one, when we're looking at charters, the majority of our charters are serving students in grades K through eight. So this is a smaller subset when we start looking at um, secondary schools and um, high school student schools serving students in high school age. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then um, the other thing is just around the differences in the student populations. So our, our um, charters in our traditional non-selective schools serve higher proportions of students with disabilities, right? 24%, um, 26%. So you see they're very similar. Um, then, of course, selective schools. Um, but the other thing that's really important to point out is when we look at our traditional non-selective schools, um, over half of their population are also over age students. Uh, and this is also where we have the majority of our EL population. Next slide. For this slide, um, we're now going to take a look at park performance on the high school assessment. And the way we're going to do this is by taking a look at the mean overall scale score for the various school types. So as we take a look at the data here, on the left side, you'll see the results for the English Language Arts 10 uh, assessment. So you'll see there that you have very different performance um, based on the school types. Again, not too surprising considering the descriptions that Angela provided about the different composition of students in the different types of schools. Um, but what you do note for the ELA 10 assessment um, is that for all charters, that is that mean scale score is around 704 um, versus our traditional non-selective being lower at 684 and the highest being our traditional selective secondary program. And then to the right, you'll see similar data for the Algebra 1 assessment. Um, again, the traditional selective schools with the highest score. Um, you'll also note that there is a reference point on both sides for what the district average is. Um, and what you'll see is that the all charters data is very similar to the district average. Next slide, there we go. Um, this next slide and taking a look at secondary student performance looks at graduation. Um, and here we're gonna take a look at the four year adjusted cohort graduation rate, which gets at the question of whether or not our secondary students are graduating on time. And here what you'll see is that there was an increase um, from 80.9% in 2018 to 82%. Um, so here you'll see again, traditional selective schools with a higher rate um, at the 91%, but you'll notice that the R charters um, line at 82% still outperforms the district average, which is listed below at 70%. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna kind of look at how students are experiencing their schools in terms of climate. Um, so we're going to look at trends. What we notice is that um, uh, our charters um, have practices in place that um, have kept their chronic absence lower, um, and um, but suspensions are a bit higher. So we're going to look at sort of these differences in what's happening in terms around practice. Um, and students and educators at our charters report higher levels of satisfaction. Um, so. Our wholly new charters have lower chronic absence rates in traditional schools, um, which are lower than our um, conversion schools. Um, when we look at chronic absence and renewal, a big part of what we look at is not just the rate and what's happening with those rates over time, but also the practices that schools are using. Um, and so because chronic absence could, be, there's a lot of factors that go into chronic absence. So it's not just the rate that matters but actually how schools are doing root cause analysis um, to address um, any challenges um, that students are facing. And so um, uh, and one thing to note too is, and Teresa, I may need your help with this. I think from 17, 18 and 18, 19, the definition around chronic absence changed around this time, I wanna say. Um, and so, um, Teresa, can, can you chime in if that's correct or incorrect? Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, actually, the change was made in school year 17 18 um, and was reflected in our state reporting at that point. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was properly holding the right time in, in my head. Um, so you can see for among the school types, it's, you know, it's relatively flat in terms of um, what their chronic absence rates looks from 17, 18 to 18, 19. Next slide. 
Um, and uh, you see the thing that's really notable here is middle school. So um, the chronic absence rate um, for our charters, um, regardless of type, is, is well below um, uh, the traditional um, rate for um, chronic absence. Um, this is, again, a handful of schools, but again, it, it's about what practices the schools put into place. Um, and so we're seeing these rates um, lower, and I think there are strong practices around supports to students and root cause analysis that come into play. And it's something that we consider seriously when schools go through renewal. So you see it play out in the data. Next slide. So for this particular slide, we're now going to take a look at chronic absence rates for high school students. Um, and so what you'll see here is that charters typically have lower chronic absence rates than the traditional schools. Um, one thing to note, though, because um, there is a notable increase from from the 76% to the 82% for the traditional non-selective. Uh, that is largely due to the fact that there were some changes in how we uh, handled our data collection, which allowed us to have a more nuanced view, um, particularly for those students that are, are part-time scheduled students. Um, and so that's one of the key reasons that you see that uptick for that one year, uh, whereas the other schools are more or less flat um, from 17-18 to 18-19. Next slide, please. Here we see Commissioner you. McFadden, I'm, I'm sorry. Commissioner McFadden, may I ask a couple questions here, or do you think it'd be best for me just to put them in the chat? Um, what, what I would like to do, thank you, Commissioner Roberts, but they have about two additional slides to present. Can we uh, just let them finish and then come back for questions? Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. So what we see here is uh, our suspension rates um, at different school types by grade band. As we can see at elementary school, um, charters have higher suspension rates than traditional schools. Um, that uh, gets a little closer at middle school and by um, high school, charters have um, slightly higher than traditional selective schools, but less than traditional non-selective. And again, um, with the, the charter schools, um, they have wide lat latitude over um, how they set up the climate um, in their schools. They do have to abide by the um, district's code of conduct, um, but we see that there is variations in how, um, how many students are being suspended um, at elementary grades. And one thing I'd like to note here is for middle grades at conversion schools, there's, that's a very um, small percentage of students being suspended. But I just want to remind people that um, there are three conversion middle schools. Um, so that's a very small sample size. So um, when you look at that data point, just keep that in mind about how why that is um, could be so much smaller than the rest. Next slide, please. For this slide, we're going to take a look at another key measure of, of climate, um, which is taking a look at satisfaction survey data. So we're going to take a look here at the state student um, and educator survey responses. Keep in mind that this survey um, was implemented for the first time in 2018 and 19. So this data is the first time we actually have this data provided by the state. Um, and what we're seeing here is that charters have higher rates of satisfaction from students and teachers um, than do our traditional schools. And you'll again see the data noted for each of the different types of schools with the various bars. Next slide. So at this time, I think we are ready to take additional questions or comments that folks may have for us after hearing the compliance update. Commissioner Roberts. I'm sorry, I had everything off. Um, okay, so I have three questions, uh, and they mostly pertain to slides 28 through 32 with the chronic absenteeism and suspension. Um, I'm going to reference a previous meeting um, 
teaching and learning from February the 4th, where we had the chronic absenteeism presentation as well as the discipline and suspension update. Um, so my first question, um, at that meeting, the board got the um, attendance update where it listed a number of root causes for chronic absenteeism for the district specific to middle and high schoolers. So looking at the slides, um, 29, 30, and 31, um, and seeing the differences of chronic absenteeism between the charter and traditional schools, it's a little alarming. Um, do we have any understanding as to why the charter chronic absenteeism numbers, I'm so sorry for that outburst in the back. Um, do we have any understanding as to why the charter chronic absentee numbers are lower than, um, lower from, why it's lower at uh, charter than traditional. Yeah, so I think one thing we have to keep in mind is when we're looking at the different grade bands because it impacts the number of schools. So like right now in slide 31 is up, which is showing, is showing high schools. So remember when we were talking about our um, non-selective schools, right, which is kind of stand out on this slide, they have a higher proportion of students who are over age, like almost half their population, more than half their population, right? Which is very different population than, of students than the, our selective and all of our charters are sharing. So that's a factor, right? When you have students who are not on track to graduate, I think that's why there's been a lot of work in, by the academic team around um, uh, helping students to have more of awareness around um, uh, um, where they are vis-a-vis -vis graduation and having those personalized learning plans and the ninth grade initiative and all of that work. Cause I think if you look at prior um, student groups, I think for some high school students, they, I don't think they really appreciated the differences between the understanding, having a credit awareness about what you needed to move to the next grade as well as having real plans around their goals. And so I think there's a lot of important work the academics has done around that. So I think that's important to note. Um, none of these are great chronic absence rates, but I think a lot of those root causes come into play, even when we're talking about our, our selective schools and our all charters, like we, we have to be looking at carefully at how we're attending to our high school students. So there's certain things that, certain changes that have been made like in board policy to that, I think get to that credit awareness issue and the importance of attendance and making parents more aware of the importance of attendance too for high school students. So I think those are um, some of the factors there. If, um, we can go back to slide 29. Angela, before you go back, um, sure. if I could just add, um, I just think the other piece to just note um, is just this overall question around what does student engagement look like for secondary students? And so as Angela alluded to, like with some of the district initiatives, not just with the ninth grade initiative, but even thinking about just the benefits of having individualized student plans as ways to work with students early on and helping them set a vision for their futures and being able to help them actualize that plan year after year and providing them with more robust in-school experiences, both from an academic as well as from an enrichment point of view are all really important considerations that as a district we're continuing to emphasize as a way to, way to better connect with students and support their needs. And ultimately, we would, we would hope that that would increase not only their engagement, but their regular attendance in school. Um, we also know that attendance is really important in having those habits early on um, to be prepared for post-secondary opportunities. So even for our students that are interested in going straight to work, the importance of building those work habits early, that also gets reinforced with some of the work we're doing around CTE expansion, apprenticeships, and other uh, work opportunities. Um, for secondary students. Um, so all of those are things that are certainly top of mind um, and are priorities for the district. Thank you so much for that. And I think that's a great segue into my next question. Um, in that same presentation, there was um, a chart, the top 10 schools showing the greatest improvements in chronic absenteeism. And that was a good mix of both um, middle and high school charter and traditional. And one of the schools uh, that was especially noted was Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. They had a 12.6 rate change from 2018 to 2019. And when asked how they were able to make that significant change in one year, they attributed a lot of it to transportation. 
and it wasn't traditional like MTA transportation. They had implemented like carpooling and things of that sort. Have you seen any other type of trends with charter schools doing kind of out of the box things just to address chronic absenteeism? So we yeah, so there have been some schools that have provided transportation in the past. Um, I mean, I think what we see among schools is, are kind of like the base, the back to the basics. So understanding what, again, that root cause analysis and providing direct supports to students. Um, with collegiate, I think we just need to be careful with looking at that as an, an example. Like this is something we talked about during the renewal process. So um, that school was also indicating to families that um, attendance was uh, like a condition of being enrolled in the school, which is not allowable. So I just want to be careful of looking at that as a um, exam. So we've had conversations with them and they've corrected that. I think that was just a, a learning for them um, um, about that that is, you know, that's not allowable. So it was a learning curve, but I just want to be careful because I don't know how much that also played a part into um, what you're seeing in terms of, of the data. I do think they have good practices in, in play that help students, but I just want to be careful because there's this other piece. And I think that's the key thing. When we're looking at chronic absence, the data itself isn't actually sufficient to tell the story because part of it is telling you a bit about the students that schools are serving. And so the other piece of it is what are schools doing about um, meeting the needs of students who might be having issues um, with housing security, who might be having issues with transportation, who might be having issues with bullying, um, and a variety of other factors that play into attendance at school. Uh, I think um, with our schools that do well in this, they attend to those things. So they have strong um, practices like around using restorative practice in a real and intentional way so that it builds community and then it addresses issues um, when it comes up with students. Um, schools that have a strong, whether they're officially a community school or not, but having a, a, strong, a strong person who connects with the community. And so they're connecting families to support if housing is an issue or transportation is an issue. So those are some of the really strong practices that we see within schools that impact um, these rates and students feeling belong, a sense of belongingness to schools. So I think part of two, what we see in the difference, it's hard to tease it apart, but like that that satisfaction component is a is a play too. So it's a mix of things when we're looking at schools that play into the numbers. That that was really helpful, Angela. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I think my last question is about the suspension. So I think that's maybe slide thirty one, maybe thirty two. Um, at the January seventh meeting uh, for discipline and suspension. Actually, I, no, I don't think we had the meeting, but we got the update. Um, essentially, they aggregated out a lot of the suspension by um, grade, by race, and by gender. And we saw an increase in student suspension. Um, so looking at the information that you all just gave us, showing that charters have more suspension than traditional schools, um, is that aggregated out by gender as well? And I guess my question is, are we seeing the increase happen at charters for female students over traditional schools? And if so, is that like an area of potential intervention of maybe like mentorship programs or, or something just to address those climate issues to reduce those suspension numbers? Um, so this is Angela. Uh, so we haven't looked at it in that way. That's a good flag. That's something we should look at. We should look at this disaggregated. We've been trying to be more intentional in disaggregating the data to see some, to see a little bit of a deeper lens. So that's a, a look that we can. I don't know if Teresa, if um, you have any insight on, on that. Um, not Chief right Davis, off the rim. I mean, Chief Jones, sorry. No problem. Um, I, I don't have insight to offer right offhand. I mean, I will say just across the board, I mean, we have a, a good million different views in terms of how we've disaggregated the data. Um, we would just have to take this back and just take a look specifically within some of those um, areas and, and tease out are there some key findings there to inform strategies and or just questions and areas to explore. 
um, because certainly we have seen historically um, some challenges just in the national data as well as in Baltimore City in terms of disproportionality that tend to sort of play out sometimes by race, ethnicity, sometimes by gender. Um, so we just haven't done a really a deep dive what that means on this set of suspension data, but that's certainly something we can take back. Got it. I just thought of that as I saw the numbers being a, a bit higher for charter schools than traditional schools um, for suspension. Um, and then also seeing the female students were had kind of taken an, an increase in suspension for the district. I didn't know if they were landing more in traditional or charter and what that looked like in terms of climate control within those schools. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to circle back with more of a complete answer. I'm sure probably members of my team probably have looked at it that way. It just has not sort of like risen to the top here for us to include it in this presentation or to be able to answer it right now. So we can circle back. Got it. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for your question. Um, I appreciate the, the presentation today and, the, and how substantive the information is as it tends to be from um, all of the folks that are um, joining us on this on this call today. I, I do want to raise um, just a concern that I have. It's not necessarily a question, but we really have to get into this uh, solution space, um, and it and it does not necessarily um, well it does speak to charters because we are seeing how. Um, many of our charter schools are outperforming, at least the data that we saw today, um, they're outperforming our traditional schools. But what has, what I've noticed as a trend um, is um, the struggle that we're having with our middle grades. Our middle grades are struggling um, and it could be for a myriad of reasons. But when we look at the work and the progress of those charters that we're deeming to be more successful than others. How are we, uh, similar to Dr. Bondima's point and, and to Commissioner Roberts' point, how are we using um, some of that information to guide the practice of our other schools within the district that are not meeting um, success in similar ways or meeting growth in similar ways? Um, so I just want to raise that. I want to raise that, you know, I've been on the board for a couple of years now and our middle grades are continuing to um, struggle. And that is both in charter and it is in our traditional our conversion, all of the types of schools that we have. Um, so I would just imagine that we are gleaning from some of their strengths and trying to incorporate that work into what we do in some of our other schools. And I, I get it that we're, we're in a system pretty much of choice. And especially at the secondary level, um, parents and, and families can choose to go um, where they think that their needs will be best met. met. But I, I'm an avid believer that if we strengthen our middle school programming, it will not only support what is done in the elementary grades and motivating those students, but it will also set our um, high schools up to meet better success. So I just want to raise that um, in a lot of the, the, the data points that we saw today. Um, the team is doing an incredible job in keeping it, and I appreciate you all for presenting to us today, but that is just a major concern for me right now. Yeah, I think that's good feedback, um, Commissioner McFadden. Um, there is a middle grades work group that is looking at those practices, and they've done um, sessions with school leaders to share practices traditional and charter schools um, to share kind of best practices. I think the other thing that I will say is like, we're also looking at how we can do more partnerships like we did with um, ECP with some of our strong operators um, to um, connect with some of our middle schools that are struggling. So that is something that we're seriously looking at. And so hopefully we'll have an update to you next year on those pieces. I appreciate that, um, Angela. And I always appreciate the work that that you do. I, I just also am concerned about our K through eights and how, I mean, all of our um, school leaders, whether they are charter traditional or whatever, in a K through eight setting, how are they focusing um, on the middle grades in those settings, in addition to the traditional middle schools that we have and all of the other middle grades um, choice options that we have. I just appreciate what you said and I appreciate you 
um, saying that you'll consider bringing this back with um, some more information next year. But it is just a big concern of mine that we're losing our middle our middle grade students um, unless they go to a school um, that is a highly selective um, school. So I appreciate that. Do any other commissioners have any um, more questions before we? Um, and what I'm going to ask is that we send those questions because the email is there so that we don't lose any more time. I know that um, at we can queue up the next presentation from um, our Office of Family and Community um, Engagement. Um, and I appreciate the, the quick turnaround um, to the staff that was able to um, be with us today. I know that last week when the board had a presentation um, on COVID and the updates and our readiness and all of that, um, there was a brief moment where we discussed um, engagement and it kind of aligns to what we were talking about today in our meeting anyway. Um, you know, the engagement of those uh, middle grades and high school grades and, and just engagement in general. I just thought it would be appropriate to hear a little bit more about how um, the engagement office is responding to um, our COVID-19 crisis, um, especially as it relates to um, teacher support, principal support. Um, I think that's important for us to discuss today. So to our family and community engagement staff, are you all ready? We're ready. Is that Chief Hyde Hubbard? It is. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. How y'all doing? Okay, I'm ready. Um, I'd like to first um, let you know, I have Shana McIver, who's the Director of Family Engagement with us, as well as Sheila Drummond Cam, who's the Manager of Community Schools, and Monique Sims, who is our Manager of Partnerships. Um, so I'll do the beginning of the presentation, Shana will jump in, I will finish out, but my team is also here to answer any questions that you might have. Before I ever start presentations, I also like to just ask for grace and space. As everybody knows, I have two small children in my home, who like to fight each other on a regular basis. So um, bear with me as I go through the presentation. So um, we wanna start out with our call to action, mission and vision and theory of action. For those who have not heard before, we wanna be clear. Talk about our cross collaboration during school closure supports and our team updates and highlights. So our call to action is to remind folks is that we wanna help parents and families become stronger partners in the education of their children. We do this in three ways, by improving our family's experience, believing and caring about our families and creating access points for information. Our supports to meet the needs of district families during the closure period have been grounded in our call to action and it hasn't changed. It is even more critical during these uncertain times to revisit the call to action that was developed from our response to feedback from our parents, families, and partners. Our vision for this work remains the same, which is to help parents and families become strong partners in the education of their children. This you know, requires a shift in the way we've engaged our parents, especially now, we have to work hard every day to improve our family's experience at the district and school level. We must not only say that we believe in and care about our families, we also show them through our actions. And most importantly, we have to create open and transparent access points of information for sharing. Next slide, please. So we do this through three different ways, obviously, positive trusting relationships, then creating strategic collaborations aligned to the blueprint. And then we think that'll create engagement linked to success. Um, we've embedded a family engagement across the district, and we have uh, work to do, our mission and theory of action to build trust and relationships with our parents, um, with authentic opportunities to partner on academic priorities, get to see engagement that is linked to student learning. And we're learning from our contacts on the ground that the work of family engagement is, is an instructional strategy is now more than ever been more important. Okay, slide five. So the COVID response supports cross collaboration. This represents so in our engagement office, we have both family engagement and we have community engagement. We have two different directors. Sabrina Sutton is also the director of our community engagement. And these are the things the team is working on right now. And then we'll go into more detail with them as we go through the presentation. So the first is technology access, obviously for designing promotion of surveys to parents and families and helping get more families to respond to the survey. We're also doing remote learning supports, right? We support with design and implementation of the homework helpline. And we've also created family engagement virtual office hours. Teachers can actually call in and get support from our family engagement office to help them engage with families. We're also doing spe specific engagement around English language learner families, knowing that they are families that are always not the first to engage or feeling worried about going to a food site or having concern about the lack of, not of language uh, proficiency. And so we actually have a specialist, Edwin Lopez, who has been working diligently with partners to promote English language learner family engagement. 
um, with food access, our, our staff, um, our community school coordinators have been volunteering as site leads at our uh, food, at food sites across the city. And Monique Sims has been actually activating a cadre of volunteers to help go and staff those sites, providing training all through the weekend hours, Friday night into Sunday evening, to make sure those volunteers are prepared to go to our food sites and support our, our families in, the, in reception of food, as well as learning packets. We've created opportunities for two-way communication, right? Our CEO community conferences, we've had two of them so far. The first one was on general parent support. The second one was on youth engagement, which was absolutely fantastic to see our young people on the panel with Dr. Santelisis talking about what's important to them as we, as we navigate these new waters. We also have Rashad Staten, our youth engagement specialist, who's been doing a week with Spirit Week in the middle of April. And since then, we've had Youth Up Next virtual events three a week from the hours of five to six, because we understand that students are not only uh, academic beings, but also social beings. And this, this time away from school and the social nature of school has been hard for them. We've also created social events for students to be able to engage with each other remotely. We've also, are we relaunching our engagement office website? We're going to eventually have a space on our website for parents specifically to go to so they can actually get the information in real time for families and communities. We've also been doing a lot of work around partnership engagement with information sharing and strategic collaboration with Baltimore's Promise, we'll hear about in a moment, and create a partner advisory group to help us vet information and share information with our partners externally. Um, we've never had a real mechanism to do this besides individual outreach. So we wanna hone in our clarify our partnership strategy and also create a two-way communication for our partners as well. We're doing parent and family feedback. We're starting uh, virtual family listening tours this week where we are actually going out and understanding what families' concerns are, how they're experiencing the closure, what supports they need. We're also doing a POSSIP survey, which is a really short survey that can be done on a phone that gives us real-time information besides the grand parent survey that has to happen every year. This is real-time data we can get back from parents right now about how they're experiencing things and what kind of supports they actually need. And then finally, our virtual learning opportunities through Parent University and virtual training for staff. We're doing a dual capacity framework training. And many of you know that's our framework for how we're engaging families and community. And we actually have all of our community school coordinators, our, our family community engagement liaisons at our partners through all of our schools and our staff attending virtual training right now on the dual capacity framework with Dr. Karen Knapp. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon McIver to talk specifically about family engagement. Thanks, Tina. Hope everyone's doing well. I'm excited to have the opportunity to share with you all some of the important work we're doing um, across the family and community engagement team. The family and community engagement team has shifted our supports to provide all resources aligned to the FCE policy and strategy for virtual. Our goals have always been to build capacity, provide opportunities for two-way communication and decision-making and advocacy across all schools. And they are still the same during the school closure. We're providing targeted supports to school communities through our district FCE specialists and the activation of our school-based FCE liaison. All have been trained in the Harvard Dual Capacity Building Framework that uh, Tina mentioned. This framework is about is a compass to help us guide schools through building school family partnerships. It's a roadmap for engagement linked to student success. We're providing take home learning kits to include designing and a customized art and learning kit for families with young audiences, which we'll talk a little bit more about. We're on target, target excuse me, to launch our virtual parent and, and uh, excuse me, parent university and webinars for staff this month. Next slide, please. Thanks. We've been laser focused on increasing our supports to staff and teachers. They are the front, they are on the front line and need our support and guidance from our team now more than they ever have. Family and community engagement training has been offered to teachers and many are signing up to participate every day, which is exciting. Lastly, we're proud to announce our virtual family engagement office hours that Tina mentioned. We wanted to have a place where our staff could stay connected, get answers, share resources and feel supported. Oh, I'm sorry. Next slide. Thank you. We created a family engagement toolkit. Joe, if you don't mind, if you could click on, thank you. Nope. 
Yes, there should be a quick 30 second video. Yes, since this is uh, PDF, it's, we don't have the capacity to show the video at this time. Okie dokie, <laughs> we'll share it with everyone. Um, that's unfortunate, our team, and so I'll just share with you, summarize really quickly. Our team thought it was really important to personalize, right? Uh, welcome, excuse me, a, a hope message rather to our teachers. Um, it's a teacher appreciation week. So we created a toolkit, which includes several resources, scholarly articles, um, learning opportunities for teachers around family and community engagement. So we opened it with a TikTok video from our staff, and I can share with everyone along with the link to the actual toolkit. We value and recognize the importance of strong parent-teacher partnerships. We know that the family, that, that family and community engagement is a key component of ensuring the success of our students. When parents and teachers are working together, everyone wins, and most importantly, our young people. We know that many of our teachers are navigating a new normal, right? Delivering instruction and guidance for learning in the homes and community. So we wanted to, to uh, ensure that our teachers and staff feel supported and be equipped with resources, tools, and virtual learning opportunities to build their capacity and confidence um, during this remote learning period. To show our support, the family engagement team um, created that message that I talked about, an online toolkit. Um, we ensured that principals and teachers received it. And already we've been receiving um, outreach from schools, engaging around um, needs for family and community engagement. And we have enjoyed um, helping them. Some have even reached out about things that aren't related to family and community engagement. And that's okay too, because again, we want our school-based staff to view us as a resource. And so we link them to the proper office um, or resource when, when necessary. Next slide. Thanks, Joan. And this slide here is just a highlight of a few family engagement key um, updates or, or actions that we've taken during the COVID closure. This slide here, again, um, acknowledges the 11,000 take-home art kits that we created in collaboration with young audiences. We know that many of our families don't have access to the materials and resources to do home-based art projects. So we work with local artists to develop a parent tip sheet, video, and kit, all the materials for families to do this. And as you can see today, 11,000 kits have been distributed. We're gearing up to launch what we're calling Operation Pulse Check, which is just what it sounds like. We want to hear directly from our families, find out how they're doing during this time and what more we can do to help. We also know that our families have assets and can tell us a thing or two about this at-home learning experience to help us improve and enhance our support. And finally, we hope to have this all done by June the 15th, and we'll share this feedback with leadership uh, school leadership, school community, and uh, the board. And now I'll turn it back over to Tina to talk a little more about what our community engagement team is doing. Do you wonder what the FCE liaison, Shana, before you do that, so they understand who they are and what they're doing in schools? Absolutely. So those liaisons are what it says, they're school-based points of contact that uh, principals have identified. And what we do is we train these individuals quarterly and provide ongoing technical assistance um, for them around family and community engagement, best practices, um, and evidence-based strategies. So they're our ground, they're what we describe as our ground game. And our FCE specialists who are assigned to the um, schools are operating in a trainer trainer fashion. And so those are the folks who provide the support to the school-based points of contact. And Shana, they're working in conjunction with the school, um, the community school coordinators? Absolutely, absolutely. And so community school coordinators, and you'll hear more about the update, but um, Commissioner McFadden, I like to think about it this way. Our community school coordinators are helping to remove barriers to academic success. And so before there could be any level of engagement, there has to be trust built. And so while our coordinators are helping to remove barriers, um, our, they are aligning their efforts with those who are focused on the family and community engagement and working side by side. Yeah, and if I can add to that, so I like to also say that 
our FCE liaisons are charged with connecting parents and families to academic success, right? So they are working with teachers and school-based staff to help identify how parents become part of the decision-making process of the school, how they are aligned to what's going on with the curriculum, and they understand what's being taught, and they can fully engage in that work. Versus the community schools coordinators, like Shana said, are reducing barriers to family success, right? So it's partnership coordination. It is mitigating things like homelessness or BG&E support or that or food needs, that kind of thing. So I try to balance them in both ways, but clearly they're all lined to engagement and that I'm going to go actually into community school supports next. I will just say Shana's team is really working hard on what I like to say, the quality of the touch, right? How are we engaging families, but what does that quality look like and how are we supporting teachers be stronger uh, representatives of the district? Because many of them don't know how to do this work during this COVID time, right? They have built relationships, they have traditionally ways of doing it, but this new time is different for them. And so we're trying to figure out a way we can better support them in engaging families. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about community engagement now. And I'm gonna start off with community school supports. And I have to tell you that I have never been more proud of our community school co coordinators and I have been recently. They are serving as our, 24 of them have been serving as site leads at our meal sites. And let me tell you, that is volunteer. We asked them to do it. They have come out in droves and have been the ones to coordinate all of our meal sites moving forward besides a couple. We also have 85 coordinators helping partners access across the district in um, helping the district partnership portal to get students support they need at school-based. We have 200 homeless families that are receiving learning kits and packets and food because our coordinators are actually taking them to homeless shelters. When they are not able to come to our food sites, our coordinators are actually delivering those packets and food and support to our homeless shelters. We also have five lead agency partners who have wanted to provide a laptop and supports to our students as well. And then our coordinators are filling the gaps, right? We have 80 coordinators who organize food giveaways, the areas that aren't sponsored by meal sites. We have 2,000 who are fed at grab and grow grocery sites from community schools and grass organizations across the district. We're doing a citywide strategy, right? We're partnering with lead agencies. Sheila Drummond, Camp, our manager, is literally doing a weekly outreach to lead agencies every week so they can have, be fully understand and are up to date on what's happening with the district for what's happening with our food sites and our coordinators and that kind of thing. So they're not guessing or wondering what it is the district is doing. We have regular communication with them. And then we also have lead agencies working. They have to send weekly updates back to us about what's happening with their activities. So we've created a form in the very beginning that outlined, we did a training for principals on what coordinators can be doing right now during this time to support families. And then we asked them to give us a weekly update so we understand fully what coordinators are doing with schools. And remember, we have 42 um, sites that are coordinators that are with the district strategy and the rest are with lead agency strategy. And so we're trying to make sure that the supports that all of them get are the same, but that we're also being consistent about how we're providing supports to schools, even though we have a different approach to a balanced approach by you know, from district staff to the agency staff. We've also been doing coordinator training. My bi-monthly bi -monthly PD has not stopped for our community school coordinators, and we're having learning communities with principals and coordinators to make sure we are continuing to have access to equity and support while we're doing this work. And we're also hiring an additional, because uh, COP dollars have been extended to seven new schools, by July 1, we will also have hired seven new coordinators to staff those schools to make sure they can get up and running as soon as the funding lands July 1 to expand the community school strategy. Now the next slide, please. So we are now also working in the areas of family student connections, meeting student and family needs and doing, doing our needs assessments. So we're, toward, we're tracking the contacts coordinators have. We have an average of 100 contacts per coordinator. That's helping us find families who are hard to reach. That is reaching out for the food and technology survey to make sure that families are completing them. And we've launched a work group to help do outreach to make sure we get those hard to reach families. We also have referrals being provided per coordinator. 15 to 250 direct family referrals have been provided for healthcare support, links to food resources, protect, protective gear, et cetera, to make sure families have connections to enrichment activities, virtual or even in person. We also have uh, community school coordinators that are completing needs assessments. As part of the COP requirements, every single community school had to complete a, a needs assessment. The ones that were not already in the strategy, uh, I should say the ones who were in the strategy formally had already done their needs assessments, but the new schools 
we are finishing those needs assessments, which will give us critical data on what's happening with the schools and what stakeholders and parents have identified as their needs to support the school. And so we are finishing up those as we speak. Next slide, please. So for our youth engagement work, as I mentioned before, we have our Youth Up Next Presents events. Um, we had our Spirit Week April 13th through the 17th to boost student engagement. We are partnering with Johns Hopkins University as they, as they facilitate weekly actually student, uh, student and parent town hall. And we have facilitated district office staff, many of which are on the call today, to help represent the district on these Johns Hopkins University town hall meetings. We also have our, had our youth CEO community youth voice conversation, which I have to say is one of my favorite nights of this whole closure, where students were talking about with the CEO and broader public, how they're feeling about this, what their needs are and how we can better support them. We've also collaborated with the Mayor's Office of Children's Success on a citywide youth engagement strategy to support their youth advisory network. We're also supporting other distributed work groups to elevate youth voice and make sure that they are represented. But I'm most excited about our Youth Up Next Presents, which is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday every week from 5 to 6, where we, we are helping with storytelling, elevating youth voice, and having a kickback session where kids can really sit back and listen to music and talk with each other and have connection with each other. And go to the next slide, please. So our community engagement key highlights, we, we've done several presentations. I feel like I've been on a road show since this whole started with Maryland Philanthropy Network, Greater Baltimore Committee, Baltimore Managing Partners of the Network with law firms, Rap Respond to Digital Equity. Every single week, I am doing a presentation, letting partners, funders, collaborators know what City Schools is doing around our priorities of food, technology, acquisition uh, device, and as well as internet, and getting fundraising, right? And making sure that we have folks who understand what the district strategy is, and they can then see where they can tie in to support us. We've also hosted various things with stakeholder groups, um, the Digital Equity Coalition, John Hopkins Center for Adolescent Health. And we're also looking outreach on targeted communities to share information around the census 2020. We cannot forget that the census is the way that our district and our city is funded by how, who is getting counted. And we were doing a whole building, a whole census campaign prior to all this COVID closure. And we did not forget that. So we are still pushing information out through our communications team, through our schools, that we need all of our families to be counted as part of the census. Next slide. So partnerships and volunteers, I'm gonna go through this quickly and I'm gonna let Monique and Sheila add anything that I have missed about our partnerships, community school coordinators or our volunteers. If we can go on to our next slide, please. So um, Monique has been a phenomenal force on our team, both with partnerships and volunteers to make sure that we can leverage as many volunteers and partners as we can get to support our efforts right now. She has brought forward over 200 volunteers and organized them, trained them and supported them and distribution of meals and packets. Many partners include Park Heights Renaissance, Promise Heights, Literacy Lab, Hopkins University, United Way, and Business Volunteers Maryland. We've also had our pop-up grocery giveaways organized in five neighborhoods. One of legislators and other partners said to us, we don't have food in our area. Sabrina went out and figured out a way to get pop-up grocery giveaways in those neighborhoods to connected those families to food before we were able to launch our 10 additional food drop sites the district had. This is prior to that launching. And then food and volunteers were coordinated through a partnership with Maryland Food Bank and our Go and Movement team to get food out to families. We also have been working with Mobile Meals, Mira's Kitchen Collective and City Weeds are providing mobile meals to English language learner families who were not comfortable coming to our food sites. You can go to the next slide, please. So with our partners, we've been working with Digi Baltimore and Code in Schools to get device access, right? We've been collaborating. I think Monique and I have been on the phone every single week with Comcast trying to figure out a way to mitigate the barriers to um, the Comcast Internet Essentials Program, removing the social security uh, barrier, removing the barrier of a back bill that a family might have that wouldn't allow them to act as the Internet Essentials. And we are continually, I think Comcast is, is blame Monique and I are trying to put them out of business. So what we're really trying to do is to make sure that kids can stay connected and they can act as the distance learning platform. We're also with PCs for People. We're using Title I dollars to actually purchase additional computers through our Title I parent access. We have a call to ESSA to get parents online and, and connected to activ uh, internet activity as well. So that strategy, while it's not a district PC uh, com, uh, Chromebook strategy, it is a strategy to get computers in the hands of our families so they can connect and get information from the district at, from our communications office, right? And our regular health updates and things that go on online. That's a strategy to help parents connect, not so much to keep uh, our students. 
We also have Heart of America and community schools agencies are part purchasing and supporting new and refurbished devices as well. So we can get those out to families as well. Internet activity, as I've already talked about, has been a huge thing, but we're also piloting the Digital Harbor Foundation and Waves Project to expand internet access through a mesh network to five school communities. That is actually starting to launch this week. Communications will go out to families in the short term to help them understand how they can actually get on internet through this mesh network strategy. If this actually works and works well, we can show the increased number of students who are connecting onto online, as well as the connectivity is strong. We're actually gonna to try to pilot this across the district. Right now, the ABLE Foundation agreed to fund the pilot project, which we're so excited about. But many other foundations have reached out to us. I talked to Weinberg today, I talked to Baltimore Community Foundation today. I talked to the OSI Foundation about them all wanting to support us in getting internet connectivity to our families. And last but not least, as we mentioned before, we're providing at-home learning experiences for families through young audiences, John Hopkins and Enoch Pratt. Um, we had a book drop recently at all of our food sites. We're actually giving uh, families food, I'm sorry, books through the food sites. Last but not least, and I'll stop talking, uh, my team added anything I've left out. We are launching a partners in education work portal with um, our schools so that folks, partners can engage with city schools through an online platform where they are allowed to enter what they are doing with partners, how they can support schools. Schools can go online and learn how they can then connect with partners. And then we have a, a function of the district where we can actually manage the partners so we know what's going on with district level office and, and school-based partners. So it's not just this catch as catch can of who's managing which partnership. And Baltimore's Promise the City Schools has partnered together through funding of the T.R.O. Price Foundation to launch a work group around the development and framework for effective school community partnerships. We have 35 organizations right now meeting with us um, short-term and long-term to help us figure out how we can reach families better, how we work with partners better, and we have a subcommittee focused on our landscape analysis, capacity building, and two-way communication and youth engagement during this time. Uh, quickly, Monique or Sheila, do you have anything else you want to add that I've left out of the presentation, or should we go ahead to questions? Hi, no, this is Monique. I will you know, defer to questions now. Me also. I appreciate um, all of that information. I'm going to jump to Commissioner Roberts because I um, I just want to make sure that she gets questions and if she has any. Um, Commissioner Roberts. Thank you, Commissioner McFadden. I actually don't have any questions, but I would be absolutely remiss not to give a shout out to this team. I love how they have been able to use the, the preliminary data or the data that come in thus far from families about their needs and challenges and they've just kind of strung out on a limb and just made things happen for some of the district's most vulnerable, most vulnerable families. Addition, <laughs> I'm sorry, I need more coffee. <laughs> um, in addition to that, um, I want to give a shout out to Andre um, because I was able to uh, spend a little time on today's CEO conversation. And it was just so beautifully executed. Um, I remember sending Christian an email and said, you know, I want to send my kudos and regards to the team because it was very organized, very um, informative. And I think that a lot of the attendees got um, their questions answered. So no questions. I just wanted to give a shout out to the comms team. And I thank you for that because the comms team is part of our engagement strategy, right? The merger of the comms team, the enrollment team, as well as the community engagement and family engagement teams are intentional because we want to make sure that all of it has a frame for how we better engage with parents. And I have to tell you, I'm going to give Andre my own shout out too, because not only was the CEO fantastic in her questioning, but Deborah Brooks being there to answer questions that special education families needed at this moment in time. It was only scheduled for 15 minutes and it went for a full 30 minutes and she was fantastic at answering the questions but also being able to just to set it up and anticipating. We did this with Denise Lane a couple of weeks ago. We're doing with Sarah Warren. We're doing with different partners so that parents have a way to connect to our district leadership and get their questions answered about special ed or distance learning or whatnot. And I'll tell you, after Denise did her, she spent another hour online answering parents' questions directly. And it's us creating that format and that ability to have that two-way communication we mentioned earlier that I think is really profound and important. Can I also add that I really appreciate, and this isn't just specific to comms, but for the record, um, a lot of the chiefs that's been able to be on these calls with families, with teachers during this time, 
even if the questions are repetitive, they give the content each time like it's the first time. That's right. Um, and I can I can really appreciate that, that there is no sense of irritation or that they are angry that they're repeating themselves every time is as if it's the first time. And as a parent in the district, I can even appreciate that. Because it has been the first time for some people, right? They might not have heard it the, the last three times we said it, and that's okay. That's what our job is to do, two-way communication. I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Bondima. I wanted to lend some time to Commissioner Roberts because I know that she has another engagement. But Commissioner Dr. Bondima, um, do you have any yes. questions or comments for um, the the team? No, I don't have any comments for the team, but um, and I appreciate. It. I'm just enjoying the presentation, and I enjoyed Dr. Um, Commissioner Roberts and her question and the way it was answered. I really appreciate it. This, this, you guys are doing such a wonderful job, I mean, and I'm enjoying your answers and the work that you're doing. But before we get started with the procurement issue, when you get a chance, I, would, I have a, a pre question uh, before procurement, the entire procurement. Um, so whenever you give me the chance, I want to ask that question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, oh, but and to, and to that uh, point that Dr. Bondima was just making, Tima, uh, Tina, um, there's a lot of incredible things that are happening, especially with your team, with all of the departments, but with your team, it's critical um, that we at least hear the work that you all were doing today because of the role that you are playing in a crisis such as um, COVID-19. So I just wanted to um, celebrate you all and your team and that work for that. But also with these initiatives, how are we communicating these things to um, families, to parents, um, to, to the community? A lot of the initiatives that we heard today, especially um, being in what we call a digital divide, where you all are working to ensure that um, families and students and the community is being engaged in a way that has to be for most of us um, re remotely or digitally or virtually. Um, so can you just very briefly just talk about how we are disseminating this information um, about what is happening to our communities and other stakeholders um, city schools. Yep, so thank you. So obviously a lot of it's virtual, like you said, do our health updates and we've changed that title now. So it's about a family update on our website that goes out twice a week. But we also have to rely on partners and our community schools coordinators and our FCA liaisons in schools, right? Because they are the face of what's happening in schools. And so our partners, we get information out to them. That's why we're developing the whole partnership strategy so we can actually give information to them that they can share with families that they engage with them. Our community school coordinators absolutely are on the front lines. I, I hate to say the front lines, but they're at our food sites, right? Doing the work of talking to families and seeing them in person and getting that sort of information across in a real FaceTime way, because we don't have that opportunity for families who aren't connecting virtually. Um, I would also offer if um, Shana wants to add anything else about how they're supporting, excuse me, teachers and sharing that information. When, so when they're connecting with families, they can also engage with families and share that information as well. Shana, do you want to answer that one? Sure, thank you. I, I'd only add to what you said, um, Tina, that we have navigators and community connectors. Um, Tina talked briefly about Edwin and his work as the ESOL, bilingual family and community engagement specialist. And his work right now, his work plan is a perfect example of that. While we have social media, we have the website, we know that many of our families, our harder to reach families, our refugee families, don't have the, they don't access those things right now, right? So we have to meet them where they are and we're using connectors, folks who have relationships with our families are in their communities to get the word out about resources, about our parent university um, and so forth. In regards to what, teach, what Tina said, I'm super excited about the work that we're doing um, and working with the school's office is one way that we get communication out to teachers and just building relationships with teachers now. Um, traditionally, it has been more with the school leader and our FCE liaisons have done a great job in the last two years. But out of COVID, we, you know, we benefit. I look at that as a, a benefit that we've been forced to communicate um, with our teachers more and have the direct line between us and them. Um, I was excited to join the uh, virtual hours today and just meet new people um, and follow up and just build trust. 
because we can't do this alone um, and we are there for our teachers. And so it's great to know that they are looking to us um, as a resource. I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm sure that you all have probably done it um, to some degree already, but um, figuring out ways to collaborate with our union partners. Um, and I think about BTU, Pizzazza, you know, all of the, all of our, our, our union partners and how they can also support in disseminating information outside of um, what we've known to be traditional ways of disseminating information. Um, so I would just consider that if you all already haven't, because I know that you are thinking about thousands of things, probably including this, but it was just a thought that I had um, about our union partners and how they can support disseminating information to um, as many stakeholders as we possibly can right now. Yeah, we plan to do so. That is in the works. See, I knew it. I, I knew it. I knew you all were thinking of that. I appreciate you all being here today. Um, to your team, to Shana, to uh, Monique and Sheila, thank you all so much for joining. I'm not sure if I missed anyone else from the team, but thank you. Thank you for having us. It was great to be able to present. Happy to come back when we get our possible survey results, as well as our virtual listening to our information and share that at another time. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Is Joe with us? I believe I saw his name. We're ready for uh, the procurement. Before that, though, Dr. Bondima um, had um, a comment to make before we start with Joe. And Joe, once Dr. Bondima is finished, um, we can go right into the procurement. Okay. Yes, thank you. And uh, before we get started, I just want to say, um, Commissioner uh, McFadden, you're doing such an outstanding job as the chair of this committee. As, as you can see, how important it is to have an active educator involved in teaching and learning committee. And I'm sure that the teachers and the committee and the staff feel the same way. You always have the right questions to ask. And, you know, so I'm just excited about working with you. Um, so I just wanted to say that before I go on. But before I, we start the procurement, I want to, I read all of the procurement um, presentation and all of the uh, procurement um, presentations have gone to a uh, bid and I think uh, the, the final uh, uh, the final out that they're requesting from the board and it is clear that when you put these bids through it was done maybe a month or two or three months before it gets to the board but what I need to know and maybe we all need to know Many of these bids and the amounts of increase and and the, the requests were made before we had coronavirus and before our, our kids were online. Teaching has changed. We have a new normal going on. And I'm, really, I'm hoping that when we present these procurement items, we include why they have changed. Some, it should be a big difference between well, maybe not for some of it, a difference between what goes on in the classroom as opposed to the students and the community being at home working. And um, the amount in some instances could have changed and increased, but in some instances it could have decreased, which means that how do you address the fact that uh, the work that we want the, um, the contractors to do to work on while our students are in the class, teachers are in class, everything is going uh, normal, which is, I don't know what we call normal now. But then what happens when the work that they were supposed to do when we made up these contracts change? How do we work that out? Because there are situations where, and I was looking at physical therapy and some of that might change. But when you do your presentation, could you do us a favor and let us know if any changes are made, because there's, there's a good question about the amount after um, we remove the students from the um, on site. Okay. I, I think, yes, that along with the authors, I think, can probably help you a little bit with that then, Commissioner. Okay. Hey, John. Okay. Can I can I also, Commissioner McFadden, can I just also make a quick uh, answer to that question? This is Allison Perkins Cohen. Yep. 
Um, so before Joe starts, um, I just also want to flag that we, um, for the reasons that Commissioner Bundima rightly flagged, we early on um, reached out to all contractors um, and asked that they um, rethink how they're doing this work since the conditions of what we're doing have changed so dramatically. And there's been a work group that's been going over proposed changes to, to contracts that um, how how various partners would change the work they're doing to meet the needs of the current um, um, educational um, climate. So um, that group has gone through contract by contract. And so that's just generally how this has been approached. Um, and then if there are specific examples of that, I'm sure we can talk about them today. But I just wanted you to know that in general, we've been going through on a case by case basis each, each uh, contractual relationship with any school support um, contracts. I, I thank you, Allison, for bringing it up because um, I think that if we address that right now uh, at, at this meeting, before it gets to the board, it will be a question that's, that's already answered, you know? Yeah. And uh, it won't be pulled. Yeah, good flag. Okay. Thank you. And, and Joe, that's actually... Commissioner Bondima, unless you have specific questions about these procurement items, um, that really was a part of what I was um, thinking too, particularly with what has come from um, uh, our special education office in addition to um, uh, Akobin, I believe that's how you pronounce it, um, and how they'll be able to um, be flexible now or responsive to the needs of our students in our schools now that we are remote virtual right. and in the event that we have to be remote in some way shape or form in the future um, will they be able to um, manage the work just like you said allison um, that with that in mind also so that's really the, the bulk of the questions that I think that we had today and the concerns that we had as a board and I'm glad that you all brought that up because I think it would be helpful to Dr. Bondima's point to kind of hear in some of these letters if at all possible how these vendors are um, forward thinking in their approach to bringing their services to our students in our schools. Great point. Um, the um, process that Allison mentioned is still ongoing. Um, we did send out over Allison's signature uh, when COVID hit and we closed our school buildings. Uh, we told vendors to stop uh, and to submit proposals of how they will then um, apply services to our students remotely, now not in buildings. Um, and that process is still ongoing as uh, we get proposals from our vendors, the group is are, are reviewing them, uh, and then we're having conversations with the vendors to fine tune them. And then when we get to the point where um, we like what we see, uh, then we allow those vendors to, to, to continue or um, to start new services then. Um, so that, that is still an ongoing process. Joe, and I appreciate that. I just want us to be mindful. I don't know what the process is like. I've heard from several vendors um, that made those requests as you as you uh, just spoke about and um, their requests were not approved to continue services at least while we're remote um, i just i just want us to remember um, as much as possible i don't know what the process is so i think that would be helpful to know how you all are selecting those uh, programs that continue but i think what is most important right now is the social and emotional wellness of our children, of our staff, um, and of our families, and those vendors that are supporting in those areas, I think we should be giving um, a, a bit more attention to those um, vendors as they can potentially service our, our, our school community, our, our district, our system um, in, in this crisis that we're currently in right now. Um, it's funny. Um Actually, we only, of the proposals that we went through, we only um, <laughs> refused, denied um, two particular vendors. Um, almost everyone that we are reviewing, we then go back and forth and, and, and fine tune their proposal to the point that it, it, it's acceptable to us. So we only really denied two, um, two vendors at this point. That's most interesting. of the other ones are, have been able um, to work with us, um, the academic community, and get their proposal to a point um, that certainly works in for city schools. Uh, and once that happens, 
we then do send out um, a communication to them so they have documentation that we have authorized them to continue in the schools then. Yeah, and I would just give huge credit to the team for the thoughtful process they've really gone through with each vendor to work through it. And, and to Joe's point, they have gone back and forth with folks to really make sure that the the scope of work is is being adjusted to meet needs, not just um, not just to continue contracts for the sake of continuing, but actually making sure that the contracts are meeting the needs of this very particular circumstance. Um, and I think there are some good examples where um, you see vendors really providing different service. And we're continuing, as Joe said, to think about what that looks like um, right now. We're talking about um, what is what are the different ways that we would want to try to reach students who who have not we have not seen online yet and how we would reach them and is there a role for um, some of the our contracts or vendors to play a role in in home visits is something we're discussing now so it's a constant review to try to figure out how do we leverage the partnerships and resources that we have to most effectively effectively meet the very unique um, and different circumstances that we're faced with right now. And I can tell you, although I'm not personally involved with all those back and forth discussions, I am told, and when we see the proposals, our vendor community is really, really working with, with, with city schools. Um, you know, we should be proud of, I think, the vendors that we've worked with over the years are really, they're in the same boat as we are, and they're trying to figure it out. And they've been very, um, very um, uh, accommodating with, with, with us. They've been doing, they, they, they've done real well with us. Okay. I appreciate I'm, I'm Go ahead, Dr. Bondima. Go ahead. I just have one quick thing. I appreciate what you just said, Allison. Is exactly where I was going with this. Um, the fact that if any changes can be made, because we have un, we have needs that we had anticipated, if we could save funds for things that came up or popped up that we didn't expect, and we didn't need some of the services that we got from the con we were getting from the contractors, we can move that money around in other areas. So I appreciate that you guys are already on track with that. And that's the thing that I was, uh, that's what I was really concerned because we, you know, things came up, we needed funding for different things that we did not expect. And we can move some of those funds to in other areas. And thank you for asking that. And that's probably some of the questions that I would ask at the board for other procurement items. Thank you. Um, I can also tell you what we are doing um, and actually purchasing products and services. We have, um, limited what we're buying uh, for, for that very reason. We are trying to um, unencumber funds that uh, will not be spent uh, in, in current purchase orders and current contracts to free up funds uh, to use in, um, in, in other areas. So we, we do have that. That's another process that, that is going on right now. We are not approving at the same level um, all of the requisitions that buyers are getting. We're taking a look at them. Um, and making sure that they fit a particular uh, matrix that we all develop uh, in, with an, a, a hope to, to, to do save some funds um, to be used elsewhere. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, Joe. And what I can do, I, I want to touch bases with you about the um, folks that have reached out to me about um, their requests. Um, if you don't mind, it, it'll be not now, but it'll be off. Yes. I just uh, if you could Just, let me know who they are, I can certainly give you some insight, yes. I will do that. Okay. Thanks. So for the agenda tonight, um, yeah, are there any specific questions? Shall I we go through these or how would you like to um we don't, Commissioner? I don't think we have to go through them. Um, okay. I think the bulk of what we were just talking about is what we all had questions about with uh, procurement okay. items. So I think we're fine with them. Okay. Just so you know, we are going to we are going to pull the occupational therapy and the physical therapy services uh, board items. We're going to come back to you at at the June second meeting with those two, please. At the teaching and learning committee meeting, at the right? Teaching and learning, yes, yes. On your, right. our, our June second teaching and learning, correct? Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. There are three people that have signed up for public comment today. Um, we have Denora, Denora Almos. I'm hoping that I pronounced that correctly. We have uh, yes, Frank. Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. Um, and is it Miss Miss Almos? Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. You 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 can you can share with us. You have three minutes um, this afternoon. 
Well, thank you very much. First of all, I wanted to thank you for allowing me the time to speak to, to you and your committee. Um, I would like to um, talk a little bit, or my comments are based on the written update on the agenda item, which is the English learner update. And my comments on that is, um, it is uh, basically, I wanted to say that it is very disheartening to read the report, the summary report on the English learner update. It is very sad to see the numbers of English learners that are not graduating or that are dropping off. Um, and I wanted to, um, first of all, I wanted to suggest if it is possible to treat the averages um, in a better way because the averages does not paint a realistic picture. And uh, it will be better if we don't treat those numbers as an average, if it is possible. And um, my questions that I don't know if they are going to be able to answer, but one of my one of my questions is why are they? Do we know why are the students dropping out? Do we have an idea? Another question is why aren't they graduating? Um, my next question is, what are we doing in the school system that they are that they don't graduate? What are we doing? Um, what is essential for graduation? And most important on your report, um, based on the strategies that you outline, strategy number six. It, it talks about the staffing and recruitment. And my question is that here, it says that recruiting and development of highly effective ESOL staffing, including EAs, ESOL teachers, bilingual teachers, and bilingual staff. My question that I have been asking for quite a while is, when are we going to increase Latino teachers in our schools that are more um, that are more impacted. Um, it is crucial. I know that last year uh, there was a, a group of people that went to Boston to recruit African-American teachers, which is great, and I applaud that. But my question is, when are we going to start recruiting Latino teachers? Because, um, you know, these numbers affect so much to everyone. And it is important that we not just recruit bilingual teachers, but that we recruit Latino teachers. Latino teachers that the students are going to see themselves in getting um, into a better academic path. So um, thank you for the report. But uh, again, there, I, I have so many questions and I wish that I would have known that this was not only um, a written update. I don't know when was this presented, but um, I thank you for, um, for this report. And my last comment is that I feel really excited to see that the growth of ELs identified uh, for gifted and advanced learning, it has increased. That is wonderful, and I really hope that we can provide to the two ends of the spectrum, gifted and talented, and other students who are English learners to provide better services. Thank you Thank so you. much, Miss. Thank you so much for your your comments. Um, and I think that um, I don't want to speak for the entire board, but I can just to say that a lot of us share your same thoughts when it comes to recruiting um, teachers of color that our students best um, see themselves through, whether they be black students, African-American, whether they're Latinx, whether the, regardless um, of their color, we want our students to be able to see themselves identified in those classes. So we appreciate that. Um, in regards to it not being a full presentation, 
Um, I'm sure that you can imagine that with us being in um, crisis, we've had to cancel um, and reschedule a lot, um, not just as a board, but as a district. Um, and so you raised some really important points that we're going to take back, we're going to consider, and you've had some staff to listen um, to what you were saying today. And I want you to know that your points have been noted. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And and I understand what you're saying. We are all experiences uh, very difficult times. However, I have to say that the numbers, um, I think that the numbers um, are really, really important and they are very negative to the academic environment. And I feel that um, English learners deserve uh, more prior, uh, it deserves to prioritize their services in a higher level than where they are placed right now. I agree. I think that I, I, I think that all of our students um, uh, need to to be uh, educated in environments that best suit their needs. So I agree with you. Um, what I will say, um, because we have to move to the next person for for public comment, um, it is not an um, in any way an excuse. But we do see um, and we see influxes of um, our English language learners um, from year to, to year. The population is changing from year to year, which is why um, some of our data looks the way that it does. But I have your questions, I have your concerns, and I have them down. Um, and hopefully we start to gain a little bit more traction a little faster with our English learner population. Thank you so much, Ms. Palmos. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Absolutely. Uh, we have uh, Franca uh, Mueller Paz. Are you there? And we have Susanna. Sorry, Arias. hello. Yes, is this Fran Franca? Yes, this is she. Sorry, I was. I think I kept muting and unmuting myself. <laughs> Okay, you you have three minutes. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the presentations today. Uh, my name is Franca Mueller Paz. I'm a teacher at Baltimore City College, a BTO building representative, and I'm an advisor for the student advocacy organization SOMOS and the student led initiative um, Intercambio that does English Spanish exchange. Uh, the students really wish they could be here for this conversation, but they had a lot of assignments today and they're working very hard with the Digital Equity Coalition and trying to push um, for greater internet equity. So um, they gave me some things to share and, and so I'll be uh, relaying that to you. Um, I first want to say that I'm deeply disappointed that the English Learner Update did not receive a presentation during today's meeting. Uh, as shared in the update, the English Learner population, students currently receiving ESOL services, has risen to 9.2%. Uh, this population of students and our community is facing a grave crisis. Uh, the report revealed that ESOL students have a 44.4% dropout rate. Compare that to the 14.1% dropout rate for students who never received ESOL services in Baltimore City. Now, only 41.2%, even less, of our Baltimore ESOL students graduate on time. Um, now, we can say that this has to do with the growing ESOL population, but the ESOL population is growing nationwide. And nationwide, the graduation rate for ESOL students is 67%, a 25.8% difference between what's happening in Baltimore and what's happening nationwide. And while we know that there's a discrepancy between our graduation rate and the national graduation rate um, with uh, the general student population, this difference is double that. Um, so as we see today, despite nearing 10% of the student body, despite being the main source of student population in the district and therefore funding, and despite facing a dropout crisis that threatens the lives of our students and our communities, uh, English learners are frequently left out of city schools conversations. I plan to speak today about the role of school choice in addressing the dropout crisis, but in instead, because of this, we must discuss the report that was never presented. Um, this report leaves us with lots of questions. I was really glad that Denora brought up the, um, 
the advances of gifted and advanced learning that increased from 0.7% to 2.5%. Yet nationally, 6% of students are enrolled in gifted programs. So we are, uh, I'm glad to see that there is momentum, but there is clearly work to do. And I ask, how do we plan to equitably identify these students and support, and then once they've been identified as gifted and advanced learners, uh, support their interest and application in attending highly selective middle school and high school programs. This update also left out special education services. How many ESOL students um, receive special education services? And how many of these requests are turned away, as many parents have reported to us and other community advocates? Too often, students' difficulties with academics is being attributed to their language barrier versus a existing uh, learning disability. In the report, it says that, quote, for school year 1920, Title I funded educational associate positions at schools with an EL population of 30 or more received the EA position. Yet the current definition of high impact from the federal government is just 20%. Why is there a 10% discrepancy between when the federal government believes we should receive an educational associate position and when Baltimore City decides to award one? Um, Frank, uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Mueller, uh, pause. I'm yes, gonna, I, yes. I appreciate your comments. I, I do. And I know that the board appreciates them. Um, I'm going to ask if you will. There were three um, for that presentation, the EL population presentation at the bottom. There are three direct contacts um, that you can send. And we certainly welcome your questions and mm -hmm. comments because I would love to see them and read them and kind of synthesize them. Um, mm -hmm. But there are also three contacts here that can, I know most certainly can directly speak to the questions that you um, are raising today. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna ask if you can send those um, to them and, and you can also feel free to send those comments and those questions to the board so that um, we can mm -hmm. continue to have dialogue around them. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, if I could just end by saying that I think it's really important that we create the space um, for these conversations and for community members to be able to take part. Um, uh, these uh, sessions need to be welcoming for our speakers of other languages, uh, at least in Spanish when there's so many Spanish speakers. Um, I think if we want to see families engaged and students engaged in our school system, then we need to make it easy for them to be able to participate. So uh, from having our social media be listed in Spanish to having a website that's listed in Spanish so students and, teach and parents don't have to keep navigating uh, through all of this English to finally find the Spanish resources they need. And it does mean that meetings like these also need to be able to have those supports. Um, there were people who want to speak today whose primary language is Spanish. Uh, is there, you know, a protocol to be able to provide them with a translator so that they can uh, speak? Will they be given additional time? I know that was mentioned at a previous meeting. I hope that that is still the case. Um, but I just think, uh, you know, this is a, a tragic situation when I saw that number of 40, over 44 percent of students dropping out, almost one in two. It broke my heart. Um, and I really think there needs to be a sense of urgency and at least make a little bit of time in a meeting um, to be able to talk about something that is, you know, really hurting our community and really destroying um, students' lives. I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Susana Barrios, are you there with us? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to let me speak. I'm also I'm going to... Um, give testimony on the English language um, written report. So I have a different perspective. Um, I was I was a student, I was an ESOL student, and uh, my daughter was born here, and when she started kindergarten, she tested, she failed the ESOL test, and she needed ESOL services. I didn't realize that she needed to fail the test, not because she didn't understand English, um, it was, she didn't speak Spanish, actually. She failed the test because she had a learning disability. And we didn't really find the learning disability until she was in the fourth grade. And that's only because I pushed, pushed, pushed. 
and I, I was able to speak English and, you know, I was able to um, get the help that she needed. However, um, there are children that were born here, went to preschool, uh, head start, and then they are still in ESO when they're in the eighth grade. And I think that a lot of children are put into the fact that because they failed the ESO test, they are put in ESO program and they are overlooked and there's no safety guards to figure out how come they are keep failing the ESO test until they're in the eighth grade. And, you know, then it's too late and then they figure out, oh, you know, they have a learning disability, but they are so far behind and this causes a lot of um, the dropouts. And that's what I have seen. If I had not been able to, um, I don't think that my daughter would have graduated from high school, frankly, because I had to fight, fight immensely for that. So I think that we need to add extra uh, uh, safety nets to make sure that we are also identifying children uh, in that need special education, that have a learning disability, and don't just put them all automatically into the ESOL program just because they failed the ESOL test. And I would like to end that by saying thank you to everybody and I appreciate everything that you're doing today. Thank you so, so much, uh, Ms. Ms. Barrios. Uh, appreciate your comments and appreciate your time with us this, this afternoon. Um, I appreciate it. Um, our next meeting, uh, Commissioner Bondima, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, our thank next you. meeting, yeah, yes, ma'am. Our next meeting is scheduled for June 6th. Um, June 6th, and I believe, um, Christian, we're planning for that meeting to also be virtual. Yes, and I apologize. That's a uh, mistake. It's June second, so just for clarification, but June second, but that will be virtual. Thank you. June second's meeting will be virtual. Um, and Christian, would you for for our publics, for our community's sake, can you just uh, go over the process for them to participate in these uh, meetings? Sure. Um, any member of the public that wants to speak um, can speak for up to three minutes by emailing schoolboard at bcps.k12.md.us by 5 p.m. on the Monday before the meeting, for the committee meetings. Thank you. And as it stands right now, there are four agenda items on uh, the agenda for that June meeting, and that's the middle and high school choice results, um, the special education programmatic update, CTE update, and policy GCO implementation. Um, if there are no additional questions from anyone um, and no further uh, comments or anything from staff, we're gonna adjourn our meeting today at 5.38 p.m. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week, everyone. And thank you for a wonderful meeting. Thanks, Doc. Happy uh, Teacher Appreciation Week to you too, Commissioner.